exposed to non-mainstream music, you know, like yeah. classical, right? Maybe classical and jazz. Classical and jazz. <laughs> classical music from 1880 onwards. A very specific. So my father, this is through my father, he had no little or no interest in music, in classical music before that. So we, there was no Beethoven, no Mozart, no Bach, no 19th century romantic music, no Chopin, no, nothing like that. List. Uh, he was interested in Ravel, Debussy, Stravinsky, Prokofiev, Bartok, Sibelius, and several others, and then jazz from 1945 onwards. So okay. Charlie Parker, Mingus, Thelonious Monk, Earl Garner, Miles Davis. That that was what he was into, and he played that music in the house all the time, and, and he had speakers in the dancers' rooms of the house that you couldn't get away from it. He was playing a record or he was playing the radio. You couldn't get away from it. So we, we literally grew up um, being surrounded by modern jazz and modern classical music. And when you're a kid, in the 1960s, into the 70s, much different environment than now because you don't, music wasn't as ubiquitous as it is now. You can Nowadays, you can't get away from it. Absolutely can't get away from it. You put on hold on the phone with music. You went to a restaurant, there's music. To a cafe, this music. You went to a supermarket, this music. Yeah. And you just, it's, it's appalling how how pervasive it is. So, and it's all pop music, pretty much. So, but in the sixties, if you lived at home and you had a parent who didn't turn on any popular music channels, you never heard it. I didn't hear pop music until I was about thirteen or fourteen. You not know it. It was impossible to hear because it wasn't ever played in my house. Probably the first times I heard it would be. Well, my elder sister who was two years older than me, so she she became a teenager and she started to rebel a bit and started listening to pop music, which of course my father disapproved. <laughs> but so I was raised and, and as well as that he was very much an evangelist on music. He really believed in the music. So he would try and involve us actively in the listening to music, which was incredible when I think about what he did, the stuff that he did. Extraordinary, you know. He wasn't a musician himself. Like for example, he would bring in there was eight of us, you know. Four boys, four girls, a big Catholic family. So he would bring in a few of us and sit us down on the couch and point to each of us and say, you're the French horn, you're the clarinet, you're the viola, you're the cello. And then he'd put on a, a, a classical symphonic album, and symphony orchestra, and then the game was that when you heard your instrument, you had to stand up. So, of course, you know, when you're a kid, you want to win against your siblings. You want to be the winner. So you listen like crazy and you, and you jump up. So, by the time I was about 10, I knew every instrument of the orchestra by sound. And the other thing he did was he used to put words to jazz solos and we'd sing along with them. So it was like transcription. You know, not that we called it that then. But that way, you know, I met Earl Garner and all that stuff. And, and you know, also, we got to know how he was feeling depending on what he was listening to. Mm. So, if he was playing Prokofiev, Dance of the Nights, so I was around that one. Probably best to stay out of his way. But if he was playing around Garner concert by the sea, could probably ask him for money. You know, so. <laughs> so, um, so that's that's really how I grew up hearing the music. You know, hearing in total music education, incredible music education. But I didn't realize at the time that it was. Talk about a, you know, what a great background to do what I eventually ended up doing, which is basically being involved in both jazz and classical music. I also remember my first really visceral experience with music, which was like where, where the, the hair on the back of your neck stands up. And it was, um, I was at home and for some reason, I don't know how in a house that was as crowded as our house was, there was nobody in except me. And my father had a thing called a stereogram, which is like a sideboard, just like a big piece of furniture, like this size, massive. And there were two speakers, like here. On which side stereo was American on those. He bought a record called Stereo, and you know the train went across, the thing, <laughs> played ping pong. You buy this record to demonstrate stereo, and we were fascinated by. It. But anyway, one of the albums that he loved and I loved was Charles Mingus' uh, um, Blues and Roots, and he'd explained to me how the first track um, Wednesday Night Prayer Meeting was about a prayer meeting, a, a you know a gospel prayer meeting in the black community. And he pointed out how Booker Irvin is the preacher in it and how the rest are playing the congregation and all that stuff. And I always loved this track. I still love it. And um, I was in on my own and I got that album and I 
director to put it on a cut on monster right turned me I turned it up to 11 and I sat with my head against the stereo with the speakers on each side and blasted this thing I was about 11 or 12 years of age and I remember absolutely being like the skin prickling you know like you know. that I remember that that's the first kind of visceral experience I had with music it was absolutely visceral you know and you know the fact that I wanted to become a musician later on is not surprising really mm. I mean I was probably destined to be a musician you know, I was I was good at it and I found that out only when I started to play of course but, but clearly when I think back at it now you know my, my improvising when I was going around to buy milk and turning on the Mingus thing it all just kind of ties in with the with the you know, an inherent desire to be involved with music. Where did you find your work? You know, back then, you know, as a musician, where did you find your own place to play exactly? Either oh, that was relatively easy. I mean, in the sense that I, I didn't start. I was a very late starter. I didn't buy my first instrument until I was eighteen, and uh, and within two years, anyway, I was playing with Louis Stewart. So, um. And Tommy Halfordy and people like that, and so that's who I was. They had gigs. Mm. I played much more then, mm. <laughs> than I do now. Much more, um, especially playing with Louis. And in those days, if you played with Louis, you were blessed by God. So in the Irish scene, mm. you know that. He, if he put his imprimatur on you, you were in. And when I was playing with Louis, um, the phone never stopped ringing with other people. Mm. I became the bass player to have. You know, I was the new kid on the block, and, and I was playing with everybody. And I played in a band with Tommy Huff, and I had a trio. Well, not, it was Tommy's trio, but I played in a trio with Tommy and John Modern for about two, three years. It's a very life changing experience for me. And so we were, I was playing all the time. It wasn't difficult. Um, there was all the, nearly all the gigs were in pubs, mm. nearly all of them. There was almost no concerts. There were a few, but not many. And if they were, they were with, generally with Louis, because he, you know, he was kind of a superstar. But I was playing in a place called Conway's on Parnell Street, played there on Tuesday nights. And at one point we played twice a week there. And I'd also, Lou would have gigs here and there, and you know. So, you know, I mean, I'd be doing stuff with Tommy Halfordy and John in the in the Focus Theatre, the little theatre now gone, um, and on Sunday nights, whatever else. So, so, yeah, I was playing, you know. I played in Ronnie Scott's in 1980. So I was twenty, mm. twenty-one. Mm. And, you know, you know. So within two two years of starting to play, two and a half years, I was playing with Ronnie Scotts, you know, playing with Louis, and doing, you know, really being in the jazz life as much as it could be. And I, what was your official education like to get you to the place where you're right now? No, no, I have no no official education. I'm completely self-taught. Um, not by choice. Uh, a couple of times I made an effort. Like I applied to go to the William Patterson College in New Jersey in the, yeah. in the maybe late eighties, nineties, and I was accepted um, on the basis of cassette. But um, I couldn't afford it in the end, and I couldn't get an arts council grant because at that time the arts council didn't give any money to jazz musicians. So I auditioned, but I auditioned on a whole day full of opera singers and people playing Mozart kids in front of a panel full of classical musicians. I know. Had no hope. So anyway, that was that, and so that was no chance of that. And also, there was no way of I played bass guitar, so I couldn't study classical bass guitar. There was no such thing. Um, so yeah, I don't have any I, now. I did a master's in composition, but I was fifty when I did. Mm. So, so that's wouldn't count. And the first lesson I ever had was in first lesson where I sat in a room and a guy showed me something was in nineteen eighty six when I was twenty eight. At the Banff Centre, mm -hmm. and it was Dave Holland. So, at that point, I'd already been playing for 10 years, mm -hmm. you know. So, and it was a pretty good way to start your lessons. But, but that's the only, f that's not really formal. It was, it was a summer school, you know, there were other bass players there as well. Yeah, I mean, there's, there are certain light bulb moments, you might call them. Um, yeah. <sighs> well, the first light bulb moment was seeing Elvin Jones when I was 21 in 1979. And, um, I, it was, I've never, I'd never seen anyone play music like that. 
way he played it. Of course, I was thrilled just to be in the same room as it was Wally Scott's. Tuesday night, the place was half full, it was raining outside, it was with a band of unknowns, and he still came out and played like his life depended <laughs> on it. So that was one. Because I, I, I remember thinking at that moment, that's the way I want to play music, like that. And um, so um, the next was the f two years later in the village of Angard, 1981, singing Woody Shaw group, again, phenomenal experience. Also being in New York, first time ever, first time ever in the States, first time ever jet lagged, first time ever being in 100 degrees with, with, with like, you know, I'd never, never experienced that, you know. So in those days, people didn't travel, it was much more expensive, you know than it is now. So people didn't travel as much. And I, I, first time I ever left the country, I was 21, you know, I went to London, the MC Elvin, actually, actually not to see Elvin, he's now 21, so on my honeymoon. But uh, yeah, I saw Elvin while on my honeymoon. But that's the first time I ever left the country. Um, saw Woody Shaw, and again, it was devastating the way they played. And of course, being the village vanguard, you know, that was such a thing. Um, going to Banff in 86 was an absolute revelation because you were dealing with a group of people um, who were conceptualists, not just great players, but conceptualists. And um, so you had, Dave Holland was the head of the program, Steve Coleman was there, Dave Liebman was there, John Abercrombie, Richie Byrack, um, and, and Dave's band at the time, so Marvin Smitty Smith, and Julian Priester, um, and an African drummer called Abraham Insignia. And, you know, the thing about that program was that it was not a beginner's program. So it wasn't like a, you know, a Jamie Abersall camp or something like that. You were supposed to be, you're not just supposed to be, you, you had to audition to get in. And you had to be of a certain level. So so I was there and there was 50 other students, so brilliant, some play, some guys I worked with many times since, and, and uh, Simon Navitov, for example. But, and the standard was ridiculously high. So nobody was talking about, you know, this is an odds of D7 or anything like that. It was all uh, conceptual stuff. So you, you, you'd literally, uh, Kenny Wheeler was there as well. Um, and you'd literally have people come in to your ensemble class. So Kenny Wheeler would come in and bring his music. The next day it was Steve Collins' music. The next day it was Dave Holland's music. The next day it was Julian Priester. So you had people like every time come in. Uh, like it was just a, like a, and of course, a lot of that music was really not just about you know, playing standards, which I was totally used to. It was about other stuff that I hadn't figured out at that time. Leighton, you know, Byrick, Polychords, what the hell are they talking about? And of course, there were a group of people there that I went on to have very long associations with later. So Dave Leighton, of course, particularly. Steve Coleman also was a huge influence on me. Richie Byrick, to some extent, at, at that period anyway. John Abercrombie. These are these are major. And Kenny Wheeler, actually, these are five people that I worked a lot with after that, and it turned my head around because there was so much discussion of why rather than how, you know. So um, it was, I, I it really changed me because I went from being a, a kind of a I would consider that the changeover from my apprenticeship to becoming what might be considered an artist in some way, a creative <laughs> artist. Not that I haven't, I'm, I'm, I'm not an apprentice now, I'm, you know, I'm an apprentice in music always, so music is so huge. Um, so what I, um, what I took from that was a huge amount of conceptual stuff and also technical information. And you know, I mean, I, mean, I, I suspend, I, I, you, you, you can't imagine what it was like to be sitting with Steve Coleman and he said, this is in three and a half, four. I said, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> now, nowadays, people know what we mean. And, you know, if you went to New Park, you know that because you did it. But the reason you did it is because we did it with Steve. And Connor had been there a year before me. He'd been there in 85. I went in 86 and 87. So he had told me about it. So that's why I went. And um, so it was a huge moment. And there was, there was some amazing things in that. Like, I remember Dave Holland, somebody talking about harmony incessantly. Uh, they asked him about it changes of chords, which, which Dave, of course, tremendously familiar with. I remember Dave saying to him, um, I, uh, Dave said, well, listen, he said, there's only two tonalities in music and they're a half step apart. So you can't be more than a half step away from the right one 
if you're in the wrong one. I thought, that was a huge moment. I thought, Jesus, that's <laughs> so true. I also remember a saxophone player, Sonny Fortune, uh, that I worked with quite a lot, who passed away last year, a great alto player, played with Miles and Elvin and McCoy. And him being asked a lot of chord scale theory questions at a, at a master class, and he just said, this was another light bulb moment, he said, you know, man, he said, you can play any note you want once you know where you're coming from, where you're at, where you're going. And I remember sitting at the back of the class going, holy shit, that's right. It's only three notes. It's the last note you play. It's the note you're playing right now. And it's the next note you're going to play. And if you know those three notes, you can play anything. That's it. Hmm. It's all that other stuff. <laughs> it's, 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 a great concept. it's incredible. It's so simple. So that was, that was 86. The next thing, then, the huge one was 89. Um, when... I had a very intense experience playing with Dave Liebman in, in Ireland and then a very intense experience playing with John Abercrombie in Portugal immediately afterwards. And at the same time, the Portuguese, uh, the Lisbon Jazz Festival was on and I went to a gig. Uh, I went to many concerts, actually, as well as playing with John and I'd just been with Lieb. And, you know, was, they're very different. And then I saw all this music, Oregon, with Trigop Gortu and Kenny Barron playing for, like, real hard bop, great hard bop shit. And, um... All kinds of different things. And I remember sitting in the darkness of the theatre in Lisbon and saying to myself, is there anything that all of these guys have in common? Liebman, John, Trilocker, too. Can, can we find one common denominator between them all that makes them great? And what I realised was that all of them do at least one thing that nobody else can do, whatever that is. And that was really, really, I mean, I remember sitting there and thinking that this is my little revelation. This is what it is, that they all do something. It could be a sound, it could be a rhythmic way of playing, it could be changes, it could be whatever. Um, so it, um, I was thinking to myself, what's my thing? Do I have a thing? Am, am I a bass player? We, gigs are us, you know, I play gigs. That's what a classic bass player and so I started thinking, do I have a thing? And I started on the plane on the way home. I remember thinking about this very specifically. And I remember thinking to myself, um, if I'm going to, I should get my own thing because, uh, you know, I, it's, I love playing with other people. Don't get me wrong. I love being a sideman. And I don't do enough of it, to be honest. I'd love to do more of it. But I also wanted to be, have something that was specifically mine. So, you know, that I could develop and deepen. And so when I started thinking about it, I thought, well, what am I good at, you know? And, and the thing that I realized I was good at, beyond the other things, was rhythm. I was naturally good at it. I was talented rhythmically. And, and as a consequence of that, I've never worked on it, because I never had a problem with it. So it wasn't something that I was in. I had lots of other things I had problems with. I was always terrified of, like, harmony and, you know, writing music and arranging and all that stuff. You know, I didn't, you know, I was very behind the curve with a lot of that stuff because I didn't have a formal education. But the rhythm stuff would always come naturally to me, so I never did any work on it because I was never in trouble in that area. So then when I got home, I, I took out my bass, I turned on the cassette machine, as it was then, and I played um, and recorded myself playing. And then I played it back and I kind of write, wrote out some of the stuff I was doing. And that turned into a very big thing where, where I started to realize, wow, if that's triplets and groups of four and you know, all that kind of stuff the technical stuff. And then I started talking to Connor about it and, and Mike Nielsen, whom we were playing the trio at the time, and they got into it. And so for two years, we went crazy, like three, four times a week down in the drum room in New Park, practicing, practicing, practicing this stuff. And that's how that stuff, I don't know, are you familiar with Hooked Up Classics? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's where that came from. That's 93, 1993, that is. And we made another album before that, but that never came out um, at all, um, about 91. And so we were in this show, and we did a master class in Berkeley in 93. We were the first Irish people to ever teach in, in Berkeley, 93, on this stuff. We became kind of well-known for it, and we get reputation for it, because at that time, people weren't really doing it. Now it's all the rage. Mm. But, but I'm not saying it was our, our, you know, it was just in the air. I think we just tapped into something that was probably in the air anyway. I mean, Steve Coleman was well into that shit, you know, but, but not in a different way to us. We were really applying it to jazz standards. Um, but... That was a huge thing, huge thing for me. And of course, rhythm has been, I wrote the book, you know, the creative rhythm and concepts. And so that's been a huge thing in, 
in my life. I got into Indian music via that. That's another huge thing for me. And not just because of the rhythmic stuff that that you know I learned from Indian music, but because I, I learned to really love Indian music, mm -hmm. the passion. And I love to listen to it. And also listening to Indian music and also other music that I I was checking out for rhythmic reasons, like Iranian music and Arabic music and um uh, Indian music. I, I started to listen to that music and enjoy it for its own sake, which is something I probably found difficult to do with music that I knew, because you know this as a musician, you tend to start to hear the nuts and bolts, and you do not hear, you start to, it's very hard to hear just music the way someone who doesn't know anything about music would know about it. But if I was listening to Iranian music, or Arabic music, and Indian music, especially in regards to the pitch information, I learned quite a lot about the rhythm stuff, I didn't know what it was, so I just listened to it as music, and it brought me back to the days when I used to listen to music and not know anything about music, and so I became a better listener, not just in that music, but I then could apply that to jazz, and just listen to the music more when I would listen to jazz and not hear the, you know, it's a bit like being a mechanic or something, you know, you say, oh, there's a beautiful car, I love it to turn on the engine, it's beautiful, <laughs> but, but a mechanic goes over, well, opens up the thing and says, yeah, look at that, that's because that's there, and they, they look at all the bits of how the engine works, and they enjoy that because they, they understand it. Whereas we just say it's a beautiful car. That's how it is with music. People just says, I love this music. And we're saying, yeah, I love it too. I love the way they use the odd meters, the volume, all that stuff. So in a way, that that's, of course, very useful to know as a musician. I mean, you have to know it as a musician. But but it also can get in the way of your actual, maybe, experience of music, the way civilians, you know, listen to music. So that rhythm stuff... Not just did it change the way I played and the way I wrote, but it also, by introducing me to music from outside the Western tradition, I became a better listener to the Western tradition. So that was kind of an interesting byproduct that I only realized in later life. So those would be kind of major light bulb moments for me, those ones that I can pinpoint. There may have been others, but... Um, oh, another one I should mention was, was playing in a trio with... So Steve Arguez, Julian Arguez's brother, and and um, and an alto player called Martin Speak in London, the late mostly in England in the late eighties. And Steve lives in Paris now, is a great drummer and really a special, a special musician. Completely, he was a guy who was the shit hot drummer around London in the early eighties. The next kid, the way everyone loves the next kid, drums and trumpet. Everyone loves the next kid on drums, <laughs> and probably guitar, but definitely drums and trumpet. So he was that guy, and he had all the gigs. And then one day, in, he, he told me, because when I, I saw him play, and he, he sounded like Jack DeJohnette, it was killing, you know. And then when I got to play with him, it was a completely different guy. Uh, in fact, I was kind of shocked. I'd never seen anybody play the drums. He looked like he couldn't play the drums. He was hanging, elbows were all out of angles, and he was doing all this. <laughs> I remember, the, you know, the first rehearsal, we were playing, the first tune we played was... Um, Let's cool one by Thelonious Monk. Boom, 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 boom. And he's playing the bass drum on one and three. Boom, doom, 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 which is completely wrong. I, that's the wrong thing to do. And it sounded fucking great. Yeah. I couldn't figure out how it sound so good. <laughs> I remember saying, what's he doing to the bass drum one and three? And like 16 bars in, I said, but why does it feel so good? So he was this, and he was a really unconventional guy. He is, he's a very creative very creative, unconventional, unconventional, but very creative, and brilliant guy, brilliant musician. And, you know, he, he was really into spontaneity and, you know, just playing whatever is the right thing to play. And I was coming out of, you know, Dublin scene where free music was like a dirty word, you know. Um, Tennis without a net, they used to say. You know, free music <laughs> also. And then I'm playing with this guy who's like, breaking all the conventions and what he told me was that you know I asked him about this one time you know, but the way he used to play and the way he plays now and he said one day he uh, he one day he was in a studio and he went took a break went out for coffee came back in and there was the studio engineer's kid was playing the drums three year old four year old whatever like doing, you know, like a kid, the way they do. And he sat and just having the best time, like, and Steve stood there with his coffee and suddenly went, that's the way I want to play the drums. Like the way that, the, the experience that that kid is having of just, you know, joy and discovery. 
So he kind of set about changing the way he played almost immediately. And, and you know, stopped practicing the kind of technical things he would have been practicing. Changed the way his drums were set up, and, you know, different angles. And, of course, lost all his games. <laughs> Pretty much. And people always say, what the fuck's he doing? You know, he's with Adam Yeah, Yeah, no, but, but even playing on standards, he's, you know, instead of he's playing the bass drum on one three, he's doing all that unconventional stuff. So he forged his own path, and he's in Paris now, he's lived in Paris a long time, and he forged his own path, and, and he's, I still have incredible respect for him. I learned so much from him, just because he was so, you know, spontaneous. He expected you to be the same. He's very hard ass, real hard ass. He wasn't like, he was like, you know, this is what you should be doing. You know? I remember him throwing me. Uh, I remember one time he was playing the, he was playing, uh, he was playing the solo, and he had like a bell, a strap of bells on. He's playing the drums with the bells, and I'm standing there watching him. And he said, he goes, "Oi!" And I looked up, and he just threw the bells out, and I grabbed them, and I was like, "Fuck!" <laughs> so I started playing. Uh, I started with the bass, and what do you do? You know, like, this is like, come on, let's let's do something, you know. And it was really a revelation to me about a different way of playing. Another one I should mention. 1993, I was in Austria and I saw a um, large group, like eight piece band or something, led by a drummer called Bobby Previtt, whose was, was star seems to have fallen quite a bit. You don't see his name so much, but he was quite a big name around the kind of downtown scene in the 90s. And he had this eight piece band, and he's a great composer, he's a drummer, a great composer. And I sat there and watched these composers, it was extended form of composition. And I thought, this is the shit. This is extended form. You know, the stuff that I made you guys do. And you know, this was it. I never saw it. I'd never really seen it in jazz like that. And that was a revelation to me that, that night. It was a revelation. I went off. And basically on foot of that, I wrote the music that came from the album. I don't know if you're familiar. Called Dev Sherman. Okay, Dev Sherman was, was, came out in 96. It's a quintet. Myself. Carl Rowan, Michael Buckley, Brendan Doyle, and Connor. And it's all extended form composition. And it was one of the compositions from that that won the Julius Hemphill Composition Prize in the United yeah. States. So, and I've been writing like that ever since. I mean, I've incorporated, and, and of course, that, that has, you know, fed into my classical writing as well. And basically, um, you know, extended form, of course, has been in classical music forever. But bring it into jazz in small group jazz, and it was in it was in of course big band jazz, but not so much in small group jazz, and even even now not so much. Um, so that was a revelation too. Seeing Bobby Previtt's band just turn me around, you know, I was like, wow, you know, what's going on? What's going on here? Bernie, how have you managed to put all these experiences and pack, package them up to create a music course? No, I learned that from going to other schools, and I particularly learned it through the ISJ. Which I believe you're going to go to in a while. The ISJ meetings were huge for me, you know, because I was suddenly meeting people who were professional educators from all around the world and who had extant courses that were already structured. And I just, and of course, I would talk to them and I would go to their schools. I would, I often, you see, I, I visited a lot of schools. I've taught in over seventy schools now at this point, and all over the continents, all over, everywhere, everywhere, <laughs> Asia, <laughs> America, <laughs> Europe, pretty much. Yeah, I've been. Uh, I'm, the only continent I haven't talked to is Antarctica. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's actually only Antarctica. Um, Africa. You were in Africa. I've been in Africa years ago. Many, many times in Africa, but I'm sure I teach there. Oh, I did in South Africa, of course. I did, yeah, I did, yeah in Cape Town. Um, so, but um, that's where I learned so much was, you know, going to Berkeley and all that stuff. And... Teaching, you know, I, I went to a lot of those schools and nearly always I was there to teach rhythm because that's been my, if I was to be, if I was to consider to be an innovator in anything, it would be in the, the teaching and, and kind of, um, um, the teaching and of, of rhythmic, extended rhythmic techniques. So that's why I, I was rarely going to teach bass, although I would often teach bass as well, but um, but but generally it would be in this area that I would be teaching. So, but I might not be there, of course, I'd be meeting musicians and I'd see how the courses were structured and all that stuff. So I learned a huge amount from that. And that's basically, I mean, our program is typical, I would say. Mm -hmm. It's not that different. The, the difference would be the rhythm studies thing is very, is very, it's very full on compared to most, most music 
jazz schools do not require it for four years. They might have, and some don't have it at all. Um, or they have kind of vague things like rhythmic appreciation or something like that. So, um, so ours is still quite unusual in that it's four, four years in, in, in a row that you have to do, like, you know. But um, that's unusual. And then the, the focus on composition is kind of unusual for, you know, just everybody, that everyone has to fourth year write those kinds of compositions. That's unusual too. You, you get that sometimes with people who are doing composition majors, but in my experience, most composition teaching in jazz schools focuses on big band, whereas not. So that would be a difference. Well, this, this course is connected to Berkeley Trail, right? Mm. Pretty much. Berkeley and Track, yeah. Berkeley, Berkeley Track, track yeah. And you also mentioned, mentioned Banff. Yeah. I wonder, from your own perspective, you've got classrooms, first year, second years, third years, and fourth years. And who would you recommend, what year would you recommend? Guys, really aim for going to Berkeley. If you can't afford it, if you can aim for it, go in the third year, second year. What would you say, curriculum-wise, would be the best year for them to go and experience Berkeley? And what year would be best for them to go to Banff? Oh, Just Banff, to have that Banff when they're finished. When they're Absolutely. finished. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, forget about it before that. Mm. It's not really suitable. It's really a concept. It still is. It's under VJR now runs the program. It is VJR, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's before him was Dave Douglas, you know, so, so it's always these guys conceptualists and it still is that. It's, it's like this, you know, cutting edge kind of education. And um, so I'd say it's really not something for someone, uh, in my opinion, unless they're geniuses in an undergraduate program. It's, it's more like, it's more, advice. Yeah, it's, it's more advice. like a master's program. Berkeley, I mean, of course, whenever you can go, if you, I mean, you know, it's, it's one of the great schools. Um, so you can go, you can go for first year, you know, if you can go, if you can go for four years and come up with $250,000, <laughs> then go. And people do, you know, it's amazing what people do. People figure it out. So, of course, it's a great school, but that, you know, there are many great schools. You know, Berkeley is the most famous, and of course, they are, we have to say, they are, they've always been and remain on the cutting edge of music education. They, they, and they probably will always maintain that. Um, there are arguments, you know, you get people who criticize Berkeley because of the scale of its operation. My feeling on that is there's something for everybody in there. You can go and, you know, you don't have to learn jazz. Uh, in fact, the number of jazz guys is quite small within the student. But, but the point is, if you are a jazz guy, you've got some of the best teachers in, in any area. You know, uh, you know if, you're, if you're doing hip hop or funk or, or or in B or whatever it is, you're going to find teachers in there who are incredibly good at teaching you that. So that's my feeling on it. It's like, it, you know, I think the thing in Berkeley is that since it's such a big institution, what's really important for a student going there is that they should have a very clear idea of what it is they want and go after it. I think if you're a kind of a shy person and you go to, you know, and you don't, you don't tend to, you know, push yourself much and kind of be extrovert. I think it could be very challenging because you're in a massive organization and you know you get lost very easily. But I think if you've got a clear idea of what it is you want, then you know Berkeley can be just as good as it gets because the incredible teachers there on every instrument, and of course the facilities are second to none. That's why it's so expensive, you know. So, so there's no reason. Anybody who wants a good jazz education or anybody who wants a good rock education, anybody who wants a good music education, mm -hmm. a modern music education, can find it at Berkeley. There's no question. Um, having said that, there are many other schools with different focuses, jazz schools uh, particularly, especially in Europe, there's some great jazz schools that, that people can go to and that, that are more you know, affordable, let's say. Uh, they're not as big as Berkeley, none of them are as big, and, and generally they're much smaller. But the but that can be that's a great that can be a great thing too you know so um, and there's great schools in Australia you know all over the world there's great schools so the opportunities now for people to study contemporary music and modern music is has never been better mm -hmm. really at the audition what is it that you're looking at, what you're listening for you know for these students um, specifically you know if you want musical things I'm particularly looking for rhythmic and stuff not. Not because of, um, you know, that oh, they'd be good at automations. And there's nothing to do with that. It's got to do with the feel of the music. How, how good does the music feel when they play it? This, to me, is tremendously important. I mean, 
You know, if I think of myself when I was 18, 19, why, and I, 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 19, 20, 20 years ago, and I'm playing with people like Louis Stewart, Tommy Halfley, when I have absolutely no right to do on the same stage as them. Absolutely no right. I have no, my knowledge basis was so, so low down at that point. I think about why the hell did they have me on the stage? And I realized that it was because my time was very good. That's what it was. It's the rhythm. It's the feeling of the rhythm. When I played in time, and this is because, as I said, I had naturally good time. It felt good to them when I played. I, I know that. I'm not saying they were thinking like that, but that's that's. there's no other reason for them to have me on stage, to be honest. Um, so this is a crucial part of playing, is how do you make people feel when you play? Not not what do they hear, but how do they feel? And it's a question I, I, I've come to realize I need to... I, I, I ask students all the time now. Ask you, uh, or I'll ask them to ask themselves, how does your music feel? If you, the music that you play, if you recorded it, record it, and then listen to it, go and listen to it, and imagine that you walked into a room and you heard that, how would you feel? Not, how does it sound? Which is what we always ask, how do I sound? No, no, no don't ask yourself how you sound. How does your music feel? If you heard that and you were a stranger, would you feel good? If the answer to that is yes, you're really on the right track. And if the answer to it is no, then you've got some work to do. You know, because if you're there going, well, you know, well, you know, if they say, oh, well, shit, I got my this down, and I've got my technique, and I can go, that's a different thing, because that's not what people hear. People don't hear that. You're there talking about, you know, Dorian Minor, pentatonic, neo crypto, fascist scale in 17, 14. And the audience is sitting there thinking, loud, quiet, happy, sad, fast, slow. They hear a much broader swathe, you know, the, the civilians, they hear a much broader way than we do. And so they respond, in my experience, people respond to feel number one. And how the music feels. Why does anybody go to hear a concert? You know, of, of any kind. I thought, I've thought about that a lot. Why would anybody go to hear um, music? Why? The reason is, uh, the only thing I could get looking for a common denominator, if you had Shostakovich and techno gig and a jazz gig and, and indie rock and a singer-songwriter, is there any thread that you can find where all these people are, um, or any people who love to go to the... Is there a thread that you can find that unites them all? And the thread that I've found is that people want to feel different when they leave the concert than when they went in. That's it. That's basically why they pay their money. They want to feel different. That could be going to Shostakovich and getting the 10th Symphony and sitting there in the gloom and thinking of the Second World War and all that shit. Or it could be dancing your ass off for four hours. Or it could be, you know, being made to feel sad, right? I mean, nostalgia, whatever. There's so many different, people can have so many different relationships with music. And, and even, um, you know, even on a, just in terms of what they want from music can be very different. But definitely you can say there's nobody wants to go to pay money to go and hear something and feel exactly the same as, the, as if they'd stayed at home. So you have to think about that. You have to think about the fact that the audience, your audience, are strangers. You don't know them. You don't know anything about them. So therefore, you've got to provide them with an authentic experience, whatever that is. Now, the number one thing, the number one person who has to feel authentic is you. You've got to play for yourself. I mean, I, this sounds counterintuitive maybe to what I'm talking about, but I don't believe you should play for the audience at all. Mm -hmm. I think you play for yourself. And if you can create the vibrations within yourself that makes you feel good, then you can have a right to expect that you will be able to transmit that to people. If you're that thing that these, these guys are like this, you're, you're being incredibly arrogant and incredibly stupid because you don't know what they like. Mm -hmm. They're strangers. You know, that person over there has a headache. That one over there, you know, can't hear the bass. That one over there is dragged by their boyfriend or girlfriend. That one over there comes to every gig you do because they think they're, you're a genius. That one over there never heard jazz before. That person at the back there is a tourist, likes jazz, it's all the word jazz, and came in. And that all of this, every time, the people come from that. That one, you know, loves music. This one likes, you know, likes to be out at night. <laughs> you, know, you know, there's all of those things. So how can you possibly create something they all like this? You know, not in creative music anyway. It might be, it's different if you're playing functional music, if you're playing a wedding band and you, it's a job and you know exactly what you have to play. 
But in, in creative music, you, you can't. You, all you can do is be authentic. And the person you need to be, and that's why I say to the students, does your music make you feel good? Not do you think you sound good, which is a whole different thing. But does it make you feel good? Do you feel, when you play that music, do you feel good? Mm. Because if you do, then that's the right shit. Mm. And if you don't, then why are you playing it for other people? Because it's inauthentic. You don't even believe in it. So you've got to believe in it in order to have that, uh, that, that thing going. And the rhythm, well, let me, so this comes back to the question about yeah. the rhythm is a huge part of that. I think the things that, that civilians respond to more than anything is vibe, and, let's say vibe and feel, if you want to call that, we could combine those two, and sound. How does it sound? I like that sound, I don't like that sound. That's what they respond to more than anything. Harmony comes in poor mm. third, if at all. Melody probably comes next. And um, then harmony. So, uh, so really, it, you have to be in control of those elements. So when I hear people come in and audition for me, number one thing I'm listening for is, does it feel good? Does that person, does it, does it, that's hard for them because they're in a horrible situation. Two people behind a desk and, you know, a room and there's no audience. Mm -hmm. It's very sterile. And I try to hear beyond that, you know, and say, you know, I'm obviously very nervous, which can affect your feel and your rhythm. But the really good ones, even though they're nervous, they'll, you'll still feel them. You still feel you can, you go. Sometimes you go. I remember the auditions of some musicians that I, that I work with now who came to New Park, an audition. And I remember like eight bars in going, this guy's great. <laughs> even though they weren't playing anything that was particularly spectacular. It was just the way it made you feel when they played. Mm -hmm. You go, wow, this is great. So I feel like in the course there's no difference in age, right? And anyone who no. wants to yeah. you know, audition, yeah. come and study, yeah. is one more than welcome. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I like mature students actually. Mm. Usually you know it's an American expression. They know the value of the dollar. Older students. Sometimes, especially I think in the university context where they come straight out of high school and straight in here, sometimes they haven't really, you know, they've not experienced anything of the world at that point. So sometimes it can be a bit confusing for them, you know, to they don't have the same realization of um, what life is like uh, as someone who's been out of school for at least two or three years, right, and then comes to a program like this. They have a very different attitude because they 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 tend to be a little bit more um, focused, I think, mm. on what they want, what they want. They know what they want. They mm. want to be part of that. Sometimes when you've got a situation, especially in Ireland where you have CAO system, people just drift from, from high school straight into university because that's the system. And I said, when are, you, what university, when, when are you going to college? So they just, they turn up, you know, and they're kind of, and maybe they're good at, well, not maybe they're good at music because the only reason they get in here is that they are good at music. But being good at music doesn't necessarily mean that this is the right thing for you either. It may not be. So, so you do get younger students who are confused and have difficulties precisely because they are young. The older students tend to be much more um, psychologically attuned to what they want. Mm. And, and older ones, again, like, I mean, particularly mature students, mature students is 23, you know, it's 25, 26. But, but we've got students who are much older than that at various times, and we've had very good experiences with them. Um, they tend to give a calming influence to the younger students and kind of, I've often found that it's great to have them amongst the younger students that mm. they, they can be, you know, kind of say. The first year, the first day, introduction day, you walk in and you go, guys, in order to benefit the best from this course, you get four years ahead. Mm. Follow these few bullet points and always ask questions, always approach the teachers and so on and so forth. Could you give me some examples that... Questions you, you should do. That things you should do. You should take responsibility for your own learning. That's the first thing. Do not accept, I don't mean accept, but do not imagine that, that learning is top down. That it's basically, I sit here and you give me the stuff. There's a, there's a transaction involved in, in an education and an institution. And then basically the yeah, transaction is we have information because we are doing it for a long time. That's basically why we have the information. Your job is to get that information from us, and our job is to get that information to you. It's very simple. Exams 
are not, should not be seen as tests of character and ordeals and all of that kind of stuff. All exams are in reality is, we have showed you a certain amount of stuff. We need to know, are you cool with that stuff so that we can show you some other stuff? You show us that you're cool with that stuff and then we can continue with some other stuff. That's what exams are. It's not this gladiatorial kind of like them versus us, which you currently, again, you get very much coming out of secondary school. You know, The way to think about exams, I think it's a very comforting way for students to think about it, is that um, it's not tests of your character. It's just we need to check that you're cool with the stuff so that we can show you some other stuff. Because if you're not cool with that stuff, we can't show you the other stuff because there's no point. So that's basically what it is. So think about exams in that way. Are you cool with stuff? So take responsibility for your own learning. By that I mean you go to the teachers and you ask them stuff. That may not they may not have said in the class, but you you want to know anyway. Um, and you, you talk to your fellow students, you make the most of the community. And the other thing is you have to work your ass off. This is high level stuff. It's like anything. It's like being a doctor or an architect or this is high level stuff. High-level craft. Art, we, we can talk about, it, but craft, we, there's no discussion. There's no discussion. It's very like architecture school. I always think of jazz schools because architecture is both a craft and an art. So an architect can be like Calatrava, right? build these extraordinary bridges or Frank Lloyd Wright or something, yeah. Frank Gehry or something like that, right? They could, that's the art. But we're sitting in a room now that's like a box, right? And the person who designed this room needed to be able to know how to stop the ceiling falling down on top of us. It's totally basic, right? Craft. Um, how do you get an angle so that the wall goes up and the ceiling stays on top? That's basic. If you're a musician, it's basic. You know, what scale goes with that chord? That's basic shit. You know, it's not, it, you can't get around it. You know, if you're going to operate in the... In the perf- now, you might say, well, I'm a genius architect and I don't need to know how to keep the ceiling up. Okay, well, go home and sit in your own and design your stuff that no one will ever build. That's fine. And if you're a musician, say, I don't need to learn any of that shit. I'm so creative, I can come up with all my own shit. Now, okay, cool. You'll probably be at home for the rest of your life, you know, as well. You'll be that guy as well. There's a certain basic level of craft and professional musicianship. And that's why most people come to these programs, is to learn that. Hopefully, they get introduced to the art, but the art is kind of personal. You know, the art is like what you what makes you feel good and what makes you vibrate, that's the art. And we introduce you to the art by, by saying, by talking about artistic things and by playing you maybe music by great artists. So we say, here's, here's some artistic stuff, listen to this. You may step through that door, you may not. That's completely up to you. And only you can decide that or even, sometimes it's not even about deciding, it's about feeling, you know. Some, some people are totally driven by artistic considerations and some people are almost never done do that mm. and that's okay it's not about more moral high ground you know it's about what's right for you but what we have to do in a program like this and i think in any type of jazz program is that we have to insist upon a certain level of craft in order to be at the level you need to be if you get a degree the degree represents a, a level of achievement you know i know it's like it feels like it's a piece of paper and uh you know that's that's what I was great. I got my degree. And it's great, of course, to be at the, you know, get the degree and be in your gown and all. It is great. But ultimately what it means is that I, this piece of paper represents the fact that I know a certain body of work. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with a certain body of technique and information. Let's call it. I, I'm, I have access to a certain, and I'm, I'm a master of certain types of information. That's what that represents. And that's what it's for. And in four years, you should be able to walk out of here with a, with a toolkit of shit that works. You know, so like being a plumber or something, you know? You have an electrician. There's a certain, there's a certain level that be below which you cannot go and be on a professional level, in my opinion. Mm. And what I is that people who leave the program should be international standard professional musicians, craft-wise. The art takes care of itself or not. It doesn't matter. In my opinion, you, a school's duty is to teach the craft and introduce to the art. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Sounds like a great idea.